Okay, it's one o'clock. We will start the uh, rules committee meeting to order here. I'd like to welcome everybody. Councillor uh, Buzzer, do you want to bless this meeting? I will. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come here today to conduct the business of Cherokee Nation, we ask that you keep your hand upon us to make good decisions for our citizens. We also ask you to keep your hand upon our troops that are stationed here in the United States and those that are stationed abroad. We ask that you come into this session to keep your hand upon all of us to make our decisions right. We ask you to give us traveling grace as we travel back to our homes this evening. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Roll call, Shelley. Bonnie. Brian Warner. The minutes were mailed to you at this time. I'd entertain a motion to approve. Got a motion in a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. We'll drop down the reports. Uh, Marshal Service, Mr. Shannon Buell. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, besides my report, if there's anything that you would like to ask, you're more than welcome to, to answer that. But I know you have a busy day today with ENF, and you were with some of my people this morning. So I really don't have anything to add other than what's in the report. But you're more than welcome to take questions. Okay, any questions? Yeah, Councilor Shaw. Hi. Hello. Shannon, I had a constituent contact me this week, and I don't know if he's contacted you, but I suggested that he contact you okay. and or our legal department. He felt his wife had been abducted and held against her will. As, uh, I didn't know who should I have called in that situation. Uh, I would have them call the local law enforcement. They did. Okay, and what did, did they say anything? Did they they uh, told the, the gentleman where his wife was, that they had left her. And uh, it was a uh, public facility, shall we say. But uh, he feels she's been held against her will. Are you, then who should I have? I, I, I can definitely talk to you offline as soon as you take break before okay. rule, I mean, after rules and before ENF. And we, Thank you. we can get the, the specifics. Any other questions for our marshal? Shannon, when we take this, uh, the, the training, that the active shooter, that we got a little bit of orientation and Various departments, I think, have requested the training as well. When these recommendations are made, uh, who's recommending those to our, our budget process? Uh, no one. Th these are these are recommendations made to the the individual department, and it's up to that department's executive director to look at those, see where they need to be budgeted, or if they need to be budgeted. You know, just because we make a recommendation, we. Uh, Quite frankly, we always take worst case scenario because we have to. That's why the council, you know, you you appoint me and you oversee the tribe for me to look at all the bad. Okay, and sometimes we look at all bad, and, and it's it's a good thing that you have people to do that. And some things we recommend are well within the budgets of the departments, and we understand that some things are maybe outside of the budget of that department. But it's up to that department to decide. Are there grant funding out there that would help? We've done this a couple times up at Sequoia School. We've gone and done threat assessments for Sequoia. And some of those recommendations they've been able to implement, and some they just haven't, and some they're working on. So it's up to the individual department or entity to decide of these top 20 things, we want to start here and work our way down to see where we can get to. So. Okay. Anybody else? <coughs> I. Uh, uh, being raised in the school system, I'm used to having someone to, administrator, to press a button and make an all-out announcement with the intercom. We talked about that some time ago, and then we said bring it back to the committee here, we would address it financially. 
Has that ever been assessed and why we would not have an intercom? Uh, we have actually looked at a couple of things. Uh, one of the things we looked at, there's a uh, geodata fence that we could buy to put around the tribal complex that if we put uh, information out, that would hit every cell phone. So if you walk in here, a geodata fence is established, and any information, tornado warnings, okay. lost child, uh, a, a whole variation of stuff can be sent to those cell phones. That geofence can be set up at, let's say, the national holiday. So you could have the geodata fence set up around the holiday, around the powwow, around the softball fields. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have in inclement weather come in, that can be pushed out through our emergency management to every cell phone, iPad, computer uh, within that geodata fence. So we, we've, okay. we've looked at that. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, we probably need a cost analysis on that. Okay, we can get that. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, good report. Thank you. Next, uh, Attorney General. I don't have anything to report, but if you all have any questions, I will answer them or attempt to. Yes, Councilor Walker Six. Hey, Chrissy. <clears throat> Dealing with the GRA for your request that me and Glenn and Sean Slate have been trying to get. You know, six years ago, we put Glenn Turpin's position in place, and the intent of it was to be independent. And uh, I don't know if her position, I don't know if she answers to the council or, or to the AT's office, but whenever I was trying to receive this information, uh, the AT's office got involved and said, you know, due to client uh, attorney client privileges were weren't able to meet this FOIA GRA request. Uh, can you kind of clarify to us if that position is independent or autonomous or is this position directly under the AG's office? So it is a separate office. On, on paper, the AG is the supervisor as far as approving timesheets and that type of thing. Okay. Um, and to clarify, I don't think that the, I think some, f some background information that you requested was, um, you were told it was attorney client because there was conversation between CMB legal counsel and AG legal counsel. Not that any, any of the records that you were requesting pursuant to the GRA were, I believe. The, the attorney client privilege that those were pr protected by is, uh, so the AG's office is the, are you guys saying CMB is your client or? No, but legal counsel of CMB, all is representation. That, is, that, is that a message forwarded from the CMB legal counsel? That was conversation, I believe, between CMB legal counsel and Attorney General Todd Hembury. Um, so uh, the, the message I got was from Todd and said that these documents are protected under the attorney client privileges. So. I'm wanting to know, is CMB the client? They're the client of their attorney. Um, and then Cherokee Nation is the client of the Attorney General. I can tell you that all legal representation of Cherokee Nation and all of its entities, boards, commission, falls under the Attorney General. Okay, so, so CMB is the client of the AG's office? No. Oh. CNG, CMB has their own legal counsel. Um, well, so Bob who, Huffman. Who, so Bob Huffman. Well, I got the I got the email from the Attorney General Todd yes. I'm I'm trying to take a step further there. Bob Huffman is an attorney for Cherokee Nation businesses, but them being an entity of the Cherokee Nation, the AG is the chief legal officer for all of Cherokee Nation, all of its entities, all of its boards, all of its commissions. So all attorneys for all of Cherokee Nation have some at least connection under the AG's office. We can have conversations with individual employees that are covered by attorney-client privilege. We can have conversations with departments, document exchange with departments that are covered by attorney-client privilege. But again, I, I want to clarify that you were not, you were asking for email exchanges pursuant to 
or conversations around a GRA. You we were not denied documents, governmental records that we claimed were attorney-client privilege. Well, I haven't received them yet, so I don't know if you want to call it denial or I just haven't received them. Uh, at this point, uh, Sean Slayton said that uh, he's not he's not giving me any more information. So, therefore, Sean denied it. You know, Todd came and said, hey, these records are protected, attorney-client privileges. And then a day after, Sean sent, sent me some confidential documents of percentages. And I said, I said, I said, I didn't request these percentages. I specifically requested W-2 wages of employees who are making 100000 or more in their ethnicity and their job titles. That was my specific request. Uh, and I'm like, and this isn't about this specific request. This is an issue with the whole FOIA GRA process. As government officials, we have the ability to do a GRA or FOIA and retrieve these documents. But now we're saying whether well, there's attorney client privileges and I'm Counselor, respectfully, that's 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 not what you received the request for the GRA saying that this record is not available in the in the way that you ask it. What you were at, we, we went, I mean, we talked about this at length last time. The GRA is for records that exist that we hand over. You are asking CMB to create something for you, to go in and pull records and say, this is this person's salary, this is their job description, this is whether or not they're Cherokee, and put that in some type of spreadsheet or something. So the GRA request was, the response to that was, this isn't a record that is available that we can hand over to you. So, but, but the W-2 wages are emailed to all the CMB employees. Sean Slayton reports monthly on the, how many Cherokees we have employed, 73%. So for them to say this information isn't readily available, and we brag about how great our IT department is, I would bet my, my entire place they could get that retrieve, all, that, retrieve all that documentation within an hour or less but that they're saying that it's going to take weeks and weeks and weeks to retrieve this documentation well, i don't know anything about how long it's going to take or anything else well, well, it, what we it, talked about last it time said several weeks and uh then then they said it's not really available this is going on 14 months it, it, now i don't want to say you guys are denying the information to us but you're not giving us the information well, I, I do think that there has been a denial. I think the, the, there has been a denial. the GRA response there, that there, you there received, has been a denial? I believe so, from, from Gwen Terrapin's office who said that this information is not available okay. in the way that you're asking but for it. you said there wasn't a, a denial, but now you're saying that no, this your, request was denied? Your request for W-2 wages, job descriptions, positions, and whether or not they were Cherokee was responded from the FOIA office saying, that wasn't ready, ready. This information is not available in, in the way that you asked for it, or whatever that was. I don't remember. The AG's office stepped in and said, under attorney client privileges, and my thing is. That was you asking for emails. Yeah, but if Gwen is independent, she's autonomous, she's off on her own, what's the AG's office doing getting involved with her affairs? Because those emails were sent to the AG's office, wow. not from Gwen, from CMB for legal advice. But. I don't want to argue with you, and I'm not I'm trying not to be. I, I, I we're clarity. conflating the issues here. I want clarity of the FOIA GRA request because there's muddy <laughs> water here, and I need to be clear as far as what 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 this is and what government officials have access to. Well, again, what we talked about last time is it is records. It's Councilor not. Lopsick, did you receive a denial letter? I have not. Doesn't he at least need the? Uh, I I believe that you have received a denial letter from the FOIA officer. Is that form of email or, or a, some type of just? I believe it's probably a, a PDF and or a letter from Gwen Terrapin that says, in response to your GRA dated this date, the department or entity or whatever has indicated that the records are not available in the form in which you requested them. So you're 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 saying he needs to put it in the correct form if he wants to. I. I believe that he has received that letter okay. from Gwen, right? Yeah, but was it readily available? Does that mean I've been denied? Is that the same I, meaning? I, I believe as far as Gwen is concerned, that is the end of the issue. You submitted the GRA. She provided the response. 
from the entity that says these records are not available. Can, in we, can you guys send an email to be more specific saying uh, that this has been denied or this isn't, this isn't going to happen of some, some sort? Because I, I'm, I'm from the country and <laughs> being readily available, I am too. I, I'm still thinking I'm going to get these documents. I believe that the letter from Gwen Terrapin, and if you're asking for what your next steps are, I mean, we've, we've faced this before. If, if you aren't in agreement that that is something that is not presentable under GRA or should have been given to you, um, you know, although I don't like litigation, I think the next step is, is legal action under, under the GRA because you submitted a request and there was a response saying this record doesn't exist in the way that you requested it or what I, I can't remember off the top of my head what it was but I do believe that it is that is a final response from the FOIA office okay. well I, I don't know and I think that's what when you and I had this conversation a few weeks ago I said if, if you were denied and you said well it's not available in, in some form I said, I hate to say this, but your next step may be legal action. I think I remember telling you that. Against CMB, I guess, because I'm they're violating sure. the FOIA GRA request? We have, a, we have a couple of cases <laughs> where people have not agreed with documents they have received or not received under FOIA and or GRA. Um, so does the Cherokee Nation sue CMB, or what does that look like? How does that work? Well, there's um, or, or does this body? I, I can't give you. I can't give you legal advice on suing the nation, Councilor Walking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. I mean, uh, I, I'll be defending that suit, so I, I'm not going to tell you how to write your petition. Have you had a face, face with Gwen? Well, <laughs> uh, Gwen, she's 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 in the middle right. of all this. She's a middle person. And I do think Gwen's job is done. She has she has provided you the response saying this record that you have requested is not available. And I think that you have to consider what your next steps are when you have been told as a tribal counselor under the GRA that this record is not available. Well, shouldn't the, the Attorney General's office be supporting the FOIA GRA process and supporting the council? Why, why are you guys supporting CMB? I don't think we're supporting anyone. I think we're giving... Well, how come you're not enforcing the FOIA GRA request? Counselor, I, I don't know how many times we're going to talk around this. You are not asking for a record that exists. You are asking Cherokee Nation businesses to create something for you to get some information that you're looking for. Again, I, I, don't, I don't like talking around this either, but it's not correct. The W-2 wages are already there. Ethnicity is already established. The job titles are already there. But when, you, when you print a W-2, it doesn't say someone's job title on it. It doesn't say whether or not they're Cherokee. So they could go print every W-2. Then they could take every one of those and go into their HR system and see, is this person Cherokee or not? And then they could go find their job title. And then they could go print their job description. But that's not what GRA is designed to do. GRA is designed to, there are records setting there that you want to see or you want copies of. And you ask for those and they're handed over to you. What you are asking is for them to do some work. And I'm not saying they can't do it. It's just not a GRA process. That is not what that law was designed for. It was not designed to have the business or departments create reports or create things for you. CMB fall under the GRA for your request? Yes. And what, By what, definition, they're listed as yeah, a... As what a, exemptions are there with CMB as far as under the FOIA GRA? What, what, are, what are the exemptions? The same ones. Um, confidential, mm -hmm. personal identifying information. Well, it's different. FOIA is very different because FOIA are public records that anyone can put on the front page of the newspaper. GRA, even if there are confidential information, it can still be provided to council members, but then you can't share it outside of that. So under FOIA, there are, there are broad exceptions to things that don't get turned over. So thing, personally identifying information. Six years ago. When Point of we were, order, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Shouldn't he be seeking legal advice elsewhere rather than arguing about the AG's office? Speaker, I, th I think this is a valid concern for this body <laughs> in the FOIA GRA request. I think it's pertinent that that we get clarification that this body can ret retrieve documents. 
I think, yeah, I'll let you go a little bit longer than you can get with our legal counsel because you're, you're, you're asking the person that would probably defend what you're alleging here. You should be defending us, not... There's not a, there's not, you're not, she's not defending anybody right now. You're just asking her questions. So, so here's six years ago, CMB, they, uh, uh, under the FOIA GRA request, the only exemption they had was uh, uh, business, business strategies. They, they didn't want those being put out there for public record. Those were the only exemptions I know of for CMB under the FOIA GRA request. But, Everything else was available under that pro under that GRA FOIA process. There, there are multiple again. They're, they're two. They're separate because FOIA is for public documents that anyone who's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation can get. So there are lots of exceptions there of things that aren't released, including dates of birth and social security numbers, um, law enforcement investigations, <coughs> personal financial information that's submitted as part of bids. There's a whole list in, in FOIA of things that can be exempt from public disclosure. The GRA is a separate law that says tribal council people have access to governmental records, which include the records of Cherokee Nation businesses, and even if they're confidential, they are provided, they are marked confidential, and they can't be shared. But it defines in there what a record is. A record is something that is, I want a copy of X, something that is, that is available. And it doesn't even have to be a piece of paper. It can be something that comes from electronic information. But again, what you ask for and what you were told is that's not sitting there somewhere. There's not a list of everyone at CNB who makes over $100,000 separated out by Cherokee and non-Cherokee with their job title and their job description. I'm not saying that can't be created, but it is not a record that is releasable under the Governmental Records Act. And I believe that that was the response that you received from Gwen Terrapin. Not that you can't have information or see information or learn information, just that this is not a record that exists. And this is the conversation that and when I say, you know, defending, I'm, I'm defending what the law says, and I'm, you know, interpreting what the law says, not defending CMB or saying that you can't see information or you can't have access to information. I also know that you, you stated that you wanted to see the percentage of Cherokees employed in the high-level positions, and that is something that, that the monthly reports show vice presidents and above, 68 percent are Cherokees managers and above 72 percent I don't m remember the numbers but I've seen them but, well that was the report that Sean Slightman had, had emailed me but that's what you get every month that's in, that's in the the financials but again I think the key word there counselor is uh, available you know you asked for something that wasn't available had to be creative correct you're you're attempting to use the GRA to force CMB to create something for you that doesn't exist and that's not what the GRA is for so I'm here to say that the response from the FOIA office officer, Gwen Terrapin, was correct in that this record does not exist in the way that you asked for it. Now, what you do after that, I don't have any advice on. And if, I, if you have another avenue you want to take, why don't you get with our legal counsel and see what the, she would recommend? Because we're going in circles here. We're going in circles, speakers. <laughs> All right, that's, I, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you for explaining. The two parts there, Chris. I mean, that was good education. Yes, Councillor Lay. And thank you, and I'll be very brief. And, and this this touches on something that I heard last month, Chrissy. No, I got no, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Because you may need to correct me. Because <laughs> I want to make sure that I heard what, what I heard. You just mentioned that something can't be created. And a few years ago, we were let, somebody was allowed to create a document. And when we put uh, Wynn in office as, as the FOIA guru, I'm not sure what, forgive me, I'm not sure what the title is. <clears throat> but she does a good job. And for the most part, it works. But once in a while, it doesn't work because documents now, because of the new law, can't be created. And during, under the old law, when we asked for documents, they could be created because I saw them being created and I, and I saw the results of them. And, and so we've got an issue here, I think, that Councilor Walking Stick and maybe a work group might work on with Selena and, and change that law 
And I also see something that I really, I'm just going to say I don't like. Whenever something gets sticky, CNB's attorneys run to the AG's office, and all of a sudden that wall goes up, that's attorney client privilege. Well, everybody runs the AG's office well, when things get sticky. Uh, <laughs> I do. Sometimes I'm adverse to the AG's office. And so it, it's not, I don't know that it needs to be always that it should not be a wall, but when you've got an elected official that would like some information, I'm not sure that wall should be there as tight and as hard and as strong as, as obviously it is now. And Gwen's done a good job. Thank you, Chief. I, I do want to. Lay, very well noted. I do not believe that the law says records can't be created. Again, that's the whole. Well, does that's it what exist? You just told us, man. That, the law doesn't re take, doesn't require that's it. That's what. That's my take on what was said last month, and that's my take on what you just told Councilman Walkenstein. If I'm wrong, then I'm corrected. Thank you. Good report, Chrissy. Okay, next. Uh, <laughs> Gwen, we should have you go first. <laughs> Good report. You can sit down, Gwen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, my report has been given to all of you. The only changes that I have on it is within the last two days I've received, excuse me, I've received two FOIA requests. So those are outstanding at this time. Okay. And the website's been updated too. We took care of the little glitch that was there and got it updated. Okay. Councilor Lay. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate all your support. Well, I think you're doing a good job as well. Thank you. Okay. All right. Councilor Critton. Well, I appreciate you. And I know, like David said, you're kind of caught in the middle here, but you're doing your job. But, but I just want to. I would like that information too. I mean, me and you may or may not be the only ones that would like to see that information you're asking for. But, you know, we, this is the elected council. Um, if, if it's not created, what, if the council can't ask for something to be created, who can? And we're, and I'm not, I'm not directing this to you, but um, if we don't have any stroke, who does? It's, it sounds like a pretty simple thing that somebody should be able to come up with. And so, aside from Gwen's <laughs> office, uh, who, do we, who do we ask for that? Chrissy? No, I... <laughs> yes, Councilor, are you through? Councilor Critton, are you through? Yeah, and I will. I would just like to say, if they want to get a work group going, I would uh, love to be a part of that. Yeah. Councilor Buzzer. Well, I was just going to respond to, <clears throat> to what Councilor Critton had, had brought up, because if you remember three or four years ago, we had a work group for the FOIA process, and that's how it was changed. So I would suggest if we want to change this, we get a work group together and get some out there and bring it back to this committee to, for our council to change it. So. I'd be willing to serve on it, you know, I was on a FOIA work group, and it, I don't think of the most popular changes that we made, but it was changed and it's lost. So. <laughs> no, we changed it. We were the ones that changed it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? All right, good report. Man. Election Commission, here's another important popular committee here. <coughs> Mr. Fears? Sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, you guys all have my report. There is a couple things that I wanted to point out that happened after the report was done. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor uh, Vasquez for the invite to South Coffeeville and Vanita, as well as um, Councillor Dobbins for the invite to the meeting in Muskogee. We came back with 30 registrations from South Coffeeville, four from Vanita Lake Park. Um, and five from Muskogee there at the, uh, at the clinic. Um, did anybody have any other questions about my report? Any questions? Yeah, Councillor Taylor. I just have one, and it's not necessarily pertaining to the report, but we have 
kids that are in that space where they are 17 now, but they will be 18 before the June 19 elections. Mm -hmm. Are you already accepting their applications, or do they need to wait? We, we have taken some of those. Um, I believe um, we, we are holding some that, that are turning uh, 18 very soon. Um, I would have to check uh, on exactly the policy on if you want to turn that in. Um, I, I do believe that they can go ahead and turn in that voter registration and we can take that as long as they're going to turn 18 before the um, election day. Okay. Good. Councilor Vasquez. Yes, Marcus, thank you very much for coming all the way to South Coffeyville. I know that's a trip and we appreciate you and obviously it paid off. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you very much. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Councilor Buzzer. Uh, Marcus, how long have you been in your position now? Uh, six months. Yes, sir. Uh, who's responsible for entering voter registration over an election commission? Uh, we currently have two clerks. We have a um, clerk two and a clerk three, and uh, myself. I, you know, if we if we're inundated with registrations, then I then I help do that as well. Okay, so there's actually three people, two clerks, and yourself. Currently. Okay. Uh, when we do the balance. Uh, are they numbered or do they have barcodes or something to identify those uh, ballots? How do we identify a ballot? There is, um, there is some identification. I, you know, you'll have to pardon my newness yeah, that's uh, for, not working, uh, for not working specifically through an election. Um, but I can take down that information and, and get back with you. Okay. And I wonder when these ballots are distributed to the election precincts, who tracks that? Do we know how many ballots go down? How many Absolutely. comes in? Yeah, we do. And we, how, how are they transported over there? Um, we have, um, I don't want to get anything wrong because I'm, so, I'm still very new at this. Uh, we have gone through precinct official training. Uh, we did that. You'll see that in my report. Uh, we went through that this past month in, in March. So that is something that um, was taught very very briefly on how that stuff gets there but like you say okay. anything that you want specifically answered I can take that down and answer that okay. for you um, but like I say I my newness and well, not having worked through, through, through an election I don't want to get I don't want to get anything wrong do you know uh, who prints their absentee ballots in the envelopes uh, who prints them we have we have a printing company that prints that we use Midwest Okay, so you don't print any balance here in the election office? No, no. Okay. <coughs> How long has that been changed there? We don't print those, so we, we contract that out? Yes, sir. Okay. Do they have the ability to print on the speaker? Uh, we probably do, but we, should, we probably don't need to. And, and how, uh, <laughs> yeah, Marcus, do you know uh, how are these ballots transported to the election? <coughs> Place for the vote. Is it by? Uh, does it marshals take them or do the election people um, take them? Or? Once again, and there again, yeah, you know, I, I know. There again, I know that we have we have drivers, and I believe that they're, what they're doing is they're transporting the equipment. Uh, we have you know we have drivers that drive u holes that take uh, that take equipment to the different precincts, um, but then all of our ballots are you know. <laughs> you might find that. I think I can answer that for him. Absolutely. I don't want to I was I waiting interfere, when but, you guys uh, were going to bail him out. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Um, Councilor Buzzard, the way the um, ballots are transported to the precincts is after precinct official training, um, those ballots are secured and they have a seal uh, that is taped on those boxes and there's a seal log that is recorded and those are done in the presence of the commissioners and those precinct officials after their training has been done. They come in on a Friday, they pick all their supplies plus those uh, ballots and the supplies. They transport those themselves and then whenever the election is over they bring those back and um, if there are ballots that have not been used, if they, let's say they had um, maybe two boxes of ballots, there is another seal that is on there. If they didn't use any of those ballots, that stays secured and that is recorded so they are securely um, documented when they go out. So you track back. those ballots by numbers? And yes. What about, do you use yes. barcode to track them or not? 
We don't use barcodes to track those. We just use um, the beginning and the ending uh, number of those. So, okay. and, and the reason, reason for some of this stuff, and you probably have seen some of the problems that the Eastern Band have had with the election process out there. And then the other question is, uh, and I know I got denied for a precinct up in Ottawa, south of south of Ottawa. Well, I don't think we actually denied. We still kind of left it open-ended to you okay. if you wanted to discuss another it's option really that we yeah, had. Yeah, I saw so. that. And I don't I, think I'm going to change anything. Right. If I do, I'll get okay. it okay. fairly quick. Okay. So uh, that's something that uh, needs to be done okay. one way or the other. So I'll get back with you on the thing. Okay, well, I'm sure there's more questions, so I'll, okay. I'll leave okay. with that. And Mark, if I, and that's the reason I, can... I said ask you how long you've been on the job because I need to uh, <laughs> Councilor Donald. working on some things. Thank you. Thanks for coming to my meeting the other night. Appreciate it. I had a question uh, <coughs> uh, new registrations, but once a registered voter, uh, if they miss two, three election cycles, are they automatically dropped from the registered voter list? Is there a policy on that? I'm just curious. <laughs> um, no, not if they miss two or three election cycles. They, they remain on, uh, on the list, and then we have a history that shows when they last, uh, when they last voted. So there's not a threshold, oh, they missed the fourth one, then they're off? I think it may be further on out. I think there may be several years down the road. Uh, I'm not sure exactly that. I can get that information yeah, we for can, you. Yeah, we can get that. Um, but I think it's out in a distance, kind of okay. further out there. Okay, good? Okay. Councillor Lay. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you guys have been having, you know, your regular meetings. I've kind of watched some of the agendas. And on document retention, have you made any decisions or just you're just in discussions now? Um, what we did um, was we, we met about was there any documentation that is currently being destroyed that we need to retain. Um, current policy is... Um, and I have that and I, I believe that is that was in the format of a letter that we had sent to you um, so we we do keep uh, certain records for for permanent record uh, we do keep all of our certificates of vote we do keep um, a listing of voters dis disclosure reporting and things like that there are things that we that are destroyed uh, after two years uh, but what they are but we scan those in we have the availability to uh, to scan those into our chronicle system and and retain those and and as I mentioned before the um, we are able to take um, scan the barcodes of each precinct signature book and keep that as voter history even though maybe those pages are only retained for two years we have those at, as a voter uh, as voter history the ballot the absentee ballot requests are also in the policy to be destroyed after two years but those are scanned in and we keep those as permanent record um, challenged ballots we have the ability to report on those now that is something that's brand new as of 2017 we can report on the amount that came in we can report on the amount that counted and the amount that did not count um, so the things that are listed in the procedures that are destroyed um, we do have the ability to report on even though we get rid of the paper we still have the the ability to recall that information and that's when you say chronicle that's in that is our that is our database our voter database system. yes sir so it, okay so, so you can see each form in its entirety yes, sir yes. yeah okay. we scan the actual physical form and you can see you know if say if you've had a changed address we we keep all of those and if you if some lawsuit took place god forbid there's ever a lawsuit in the Cherokee election <laughs> yeah. you, you're able to draw that stuff back we in. can okay that's great <laughs> and, and so you mentioned on one of your agendas election law change suggestions have you come to any suggestions that you're going to bring to us or you're not ready for that? We, that is still in the works, yes. And when you got, you know, y'all are autonomous. Yes, and you have your own lawyer. And yet things still seem to be 
sent off to the AG's office when when the when it hits the fan. And so at that point, are you the client of the Attorney General also, just like CMB is? We have, um, our policy is that we are not an investigative uh, body. And in our policies um, and according to the act, that is the process that we follow is to turn those things over to the AG because we are not a body to investigate those things. When complaints come into us, we follow the protocol, we go through our attorney, and, um, and that is how those things go, uh, go further because um, we don't have that authority to do that investigation. No, no, you don't. But my question is, at that point, do you become attorney-client privilege with the AG's office? I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. Todd, Chrissy, care to enlighten me a little bit? I mean, there's an example right now. We have a case where both the Cherokee Nation Election Commission and the Attorney General's Office were sued as defendants um, by Mr. Rodham Mays. So we're both defendants in this. We, you know, consult with the Election Commission's attorney. I think if anyone attempted to get communications between us and the attorney of the election commission, we would absolutely say that that was protected subject to litigation, but we do not represent them. Um, <coughs> is their attorney, and he is there, and, and when they've been sued, like you said, it, <laughs> it happens. Now, they're represented by in, independent counsel. He's on contract with them, they pay him, he gives them legal advice. And, and, and I, I think, so am I trying to split a hair because here, these, I think the, because they're the constitutionally body, separate. The autonomous body hands it off to the AG's office. And at only, that time, does that shield go up that says you can't, you can't touch it? Only, the only thing they hand off to the AG's office are if there are allegations of violations of the election law. Because again, they don't, if someone challenges a candidacy or whatever, that's all them. We're not involved in that at all. If they, if, if someone is accused of, you know, doing something criminal or even civilly illegal per the code, you all passed a law saying that that comes to us to be investigated because they're not investigators. That is, that's our connection with the election commission, that if there are allegations of violation of the election code, it is referred to the AG's office. If we believe that criminal conduct was, was committed, we would also work with the marshal service on that because they investigate crimes. If it was, simply a civil violation of the law, then we would, you know, talk to people, get records, look at those, and determine whether or not the law has been violated. But the, what they can do is declare candidates ineligible. They can declare ballots not valid if they're not marked correctly or not returned correctly. But they can't, you know, say you, Cherokee Nation voter, or you, Cherokee Nation citizen, did X wrong, and now you have to do Y because you violated our election law, because there's, not, there's nothing like that in the process. And we can't do that either. We can simply say, yes, it was violated. No, it wasn't. And if it was, hopefully the next time we do election law revisions, a change is made to, to keep that from happening again. But again, the interaction is only when they receive or become aware of allegations of violation of the election code that they refer to us for investigation. And that is per statute. And, and that's at the point that the attorney-client privilege begins between you and the election commission. Yeah. Well, I want to represent them. I mean, they would be sending us documents. We'd be talking with our people. That, this is <coughs> why people don't like lawyers. <laughs> Y'all, you ask you a direct That's question, why we have lawyers. and you say it depends, <laughs> or some answer like that. So, so name me a board or with the Cherokee Nation that you all don't have anything to do with whatsoever. That's just totally out there on its own. Tribal Council, Chief's Office, Housing Authority. Housing Authority. We're not a board. We're an elected body. Right. We're a constitutional body. So please don't. I'm make sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you say board. I, I thought you meant areas of the Cherokee Nation. No, I said boards or housing authority. Yes, they're separate, state incorporated. Okay. Have their own attorney. So they can't come to you for assistance if they get sued. Correct. Ever. You know the way they're set up. Now. Right. 
They're separate. They're not so, our so police. So that's one. Even though we call them Cherokee Nation Housing Authority, they're out there on their own. Maybe. Is there another one? I'm sure there are lots. Um, well, I don't know. No, the reason they're one is because they're not part of Cherokee Nation. Even though we fund them. We do not. We pass through funding. We, we pass through funding. They are a state, state. incorporated housing authority. Right. They state. are under state law. So I'm just looking for which one is not. Could not be I don't think there are any. Um, so attorney tax commission, gaming commission, environmental protection commission, we offer legal services right. to all those organizations. Uh, Cherokee Heritage Center, um, Sequoia Public Schools, all of those organizations, we act as their counsel. If they get sued, we defend them. So when that, that happens, that attorney client privilege happens, that wall goes up. And that's one of Councilman Walker Sticks. What, what Walker, Councilman Walker Sticks requested. Information that he would like to ask. What he requested. Let's don't get back into what? <coughs> Chrissy, let's don't get back into what? Let's, let's answer his question here. We've got a lot on the agenda here. We represent all boards and commissions, with the exception of the constitutionally created election commission. Um, we don't represent other branches of government. Council has their own attorney. Chief has his own attorney. Now, if you're sued in your official capacity as the Council of Cherokee Nation, or the Chief is named, or the Cherokee Nation is named, we participate in defending those suits. Um, but we don't provide legal advice. But we do that for every board and commission in the Cherokee Nation that is statutorily created. And, and that's why I was asking exactly specifically about the election commission. They do not represent them. And, well, unless it goes, you are because you're being named with them along in this lawsuit that you just mentioned. That but they have their own counsel. They filed their own I responses. Understand. We were just named defendants together. Whenever they don't, the lady just told us, when they don't have an investigative email, so they ship it to the AG's office. At that point, you are now an attorney-client privilege area. Is that correct or not? I don't believe so. We would just be doing an investigation. We would be at, we would possibly interview them. We would ask for their records, but we would not be advising them on what steps to take or what action to take. We may turn over a, a final report back to them if they refer something to investigation, but but we would not be their attorney. We would not be representing them in that case. And we, we never have. They've always had independent counsel as far as I know. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Counselor Walker State. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, you might need, need help answering these. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, but do you guys have the ability to print absentee ballots and, and so forth? Um, <coughs> we don't print the absentee ballots. We don't print them. We create the setup for them. I mean, I mean do you guys have the ability? To print those, do you have the ability? Say, say you guys ran out of absentee ballots. What's the process? Do you guys gotta go order new ones, or do you print them off? What do you do? We go back through the same process that we had. We don't print any. We don't print any ballots or anything from our office. We try to get a specific number based on several years ahead and what races are in that election and. Um, so many times we do end up, you know, with, with extra ballots, but um, those ballots are all accounted for. But no, we don't print any ballots at our office. We go through another uh, printing company for the ballots. Okay. Um, you guys mentioned about uh, keeping record of extra ballots that might be there. Who tracks those and what's your tracking system? The tracking system is the seal log that, um, that is recorded when those ballots leave the office and it's recorded by the precinct official in the presence of an election commissioner and it's signed off um, by both parties and then whenever that comes back it's also recorded again and then when we are doing um, the uh, opening um, boxes or whatever we also record those seal logs um, there in the election office um, if, if a box is not opened, uh, let's say it was just extra ballots or whatever, um, and if there were a, um, 
a recount or something, then um, those seal logs are still there. Um, and we have a recording system to take care of that. Okay. The, uh, uh, have, have you guys ever took part in printing off ballots in, in history of the election commission? I guess during your during your time being there, have you guys ever had to reprint or, or get? No, more? not since I've been on. Um, whenever um, previously, the election commission uh, in years past had a um, a different agency that they went through and a vendor that was used, and then um, we ended up not using that vendor we came um, to agree on another vendor and then we after um, a period of time decided to come to this body to see if you would give us the funding so that we could purchase the equipment do our own training and hold our own elections and so that's where we are now so talking about the the equipment the, the voting machines mm -hmm. where are those are those stored at the election commission or do we rent those or those are stored in the vault at the election commission. Okay, so those are secured. Yes, yes. Okay. And as far as security cameras goes, they're in the election commission. Do you guys know how many security cameras are in the election commission? I don't know right off how many we have, but uh, we do have several. Several. But would cameras. you say the video surveillance covers all areas of the election commission, or are there some blind spots? I believe it adequately covers everything. We um, approved that as a commission uh, in a meeting as to how many cameras we felt we needed and where those were located. Okay, and how long are those uh, on for, or as far as getting the, uh, the coverage, uh, how long, is it two weeks or a month uh, before those are erased or as far as um, the- I'm not uh, sure the exact no, amount. I can, um, I can get that number for you. That's go through the IT department or someone may have that information or uh, we don't go through the IT department yeah. for that we have our own security system that we go through okay all right <clears throat> I would hope not <laughs> yeah. if, if you would just I'd like to know if if the whole entire election commission is secure with video surveillance I'd like to know that part okay. and, uh, and and the number of cameras and then and how long the um, the data is good for not the data but the recording if it's two weeks or a month or when it when it erases okay I'll, I'll, I'll email you <coughs> okay that information right, thank you thanks speaker good okay uh, Councilor Critton yes appreciate what you guys do of course uh, here a while back we were talking about a street in Stillwell that was being considered to change you know what I'm talking about Second Street, I believe. Um, you might have been dealing more with Connie on mm -hmm. that, um, I'm, uh, or maybe Marcus no, can answer that. Okay. But I, I'd asked if for sure I wanted to be in on those conversations, but mm -hmm. do you know if there hasn't been anything new happen to decide in what district that's going to be? Has there? Um, as far as if there's anything new, I don't believe anything is new. Uh, we'll be happy to get with you on a specific question. Uh, that you might have, you know, it, do you have a specific question? But I do. Frank, do you remember that street they were thinking about changing? About? Um, yeah, it was, uh, used to be, it was Highway 59, and that is actually 2nd Street, or the old, 2nd Street and still was the old highway that old would go through town. Now we have a bypass that is right. considered Highway 59, and we just need to get a determination which street for sure is going to be used before well, if you guys would put that in an email to the election commission uh what your specifics are that you're asking because i didn't know that there had been a question asked of anyone i was not aware of that so oh, it was asked probably a year ago <laughs> yeah if you would just make a note and please don't make a determination until you contact well would you Frank put or, uh, would you put yes. your request specifically yes. in an email to the election yes. commission or, yes. and then we can take it okay. go next okay but, uh, yeah I was th I've been thinking a while, just curious, and Dick touched on it, and uh, I almost got the answer, but maybe you can help me. Uh, let's say you find something not on the up and up uh, during an election time. Uh, so is it my understanding that it goes to the Attorney General's office? Through your attorney first, right? Through our attorney, and then to the AG's office. Okay. Now where does it go from there? 
Um, sometimes they will um, do an investigation, get back with us, as Chrissy said, ask us questions, and, um, and then um, that information is brought back to us, and then we make a decision from there. They do not make a decision well, for the us. Cherokee Nation Election Commission. It goes to the Cherokee Nation Attorney General, and there's no independent eyes anywhere. Not that I'm aware of. What? Not, not saying this happens, but we're always trying to CYA around here. Um, what's to prevent uh, sometime down the road, years maybe, a attorney general's office who maybe supports a certain group of folks? Who's to prevent them? Is there some kind of prevention where they can't sweep that thing that wasn't quite on the up and up? Because right now it seems Cherokee Nation Election Commission Cherokee Nation's Attorney General, and control might be a bad word, but it sounds like we're controlling our election. Well, you know, I'm just reporting on the, the policy that we have in place, right, and, right. And, um, not, and according to the Election Act and it, our policies, that's what When it goes above your do, head, so. yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting on to you. Do, do you. Does the Attorney General's office, how do you, how would you protect from that happening sometime with no independent eyes looking? Cherokee Nation is a sovereign nation. Uh, we have the right to self-determination. Uh, part of that self-determination is conducting our own elections. Uh, we have an independent election commission that is uh, a hybrid of appointed by the chief, confirmed by the council. Uh, Cherokee Nation, all of it's Cherokee Nation. All of it's Cherokee Nation. These are Cherokee Nation elections. Uh, you have a marshal service that is appointed by the chief, confirmed by the tribal council. You have an attorney general that is appointed uh, by the chief, confirmed by the tribal what, council. What protects, what protects <coughs> any funny business uh, where, where, now, I know nobody in history has ever had their favorite people that they wanted elected. I'm just speaking hypothetically. What protects the, all of these Cherokee Nation entities from, from not quite looking so hard at this one allegation? There are safeguards that are built into the Cherokee Nation Constitution. Uh, for instance, the independence of the Election Commission, first and foremost. Uh, if you look at other tribal constitutions, you would be hard pressed to find a truly independent Election Commission like the Cherokee Nation does. Uh, also, in the Cherokee Nation Constitution, through the Marshall Service. Why would it ever come to you? Why? Mm -hmm. Because they're strictly the attorney independent. general is the attorney general is the chief law enforcement officer of the Cherokee Nation, and the safeguards that that I alluded to with the marshal in the attorney general's office, uh, the Constitution uh, Convention had the foresight to stagger those terms. For instance, the attorney general's office has a five-year term that will not run concurrent with uh, the the, uh, uh, the principal chief, and so does the marshal service. That builds that builds an institutional independence. Like you said, not everyone's, you know, so, so therefore you don't always are going to have your guy in office or your, your, your lady in office. But it just comes down to uh, the, the fact that uh, either you have trust in your government or you don't. That's, that's a big question for some. Well, <laughs> it is for you. I hope you well, learn hey, more about the, hey. the, the Cherokee Nation. Huh? I hope you learn more about the institutions of the well, Cherokee now, Nation. Now, don't point at me. Right. I said it is for some. Okay. Don't put words in my mouth. All right. But does anybody else think that that's a, uh, you know, it leaves room for speculation at the least? Uh, well, would you, would you rather have the United States come in and monitor our election? Do you want to go to a BIA election? Absolutely uh, not. Do you want to uh, uh, have um, uh, another uh, Indian tribe? Now, well, you're asking me a lot of questions in a row. You're asking me a lot of questions in a row. I was asking the process. Well, well, and so, so there's, there's no <coughs> order. Hey, I think we're if you guys have some questions. Hey, uh, Attorney General, appreciate you. Thank Councilor you. Critton, you through? You appreciate me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I'm through>. <laughs> 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 Councilor Baker. Like a show. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yes, I have a question. Can you explain to me why, when people vote in the last election, why they don't automatically get an absentee ballot? 
uh, people who requested an absentee ballot emailed to them. Why is this pr uh, procedure done? So, so the qu your question is, why don't they automatically? Get yes. One? Why don't they automatically get that? Um, that's um, that's just the way the policy is. That you know they uh, have to request it, and then there's a, a form that we go through and a, a procedure that um, is done. Um, that's that's how it is right now. Mm -hmm. So. Is, is it possible that that could change down the road? I mean, I think it's very inconvenient for P our, our citizens at large, especially, uh, to always find time. Some of them don't even know perhaps an election's existing. But uh, is there anything that we could do in the future that maybe that rule could be changed? Well, um, we can certainly look at it and, um, and do some research on that and take it back to the, the full commission. Um, you know, you're also looking at um, funding there and dollar amounts if you're just sending out you know those and you may have somebody you know lots of somebody's that did not vote and you're just automatically sending those out you know I know that would be a big uh, a big factor is the funding for it. and then one other question can you tell me what's happening on the notary process out in California I would not be able to respond to that right now. Uh, we can take that down and we can get back with you on that. Sure. I just Connie is usually the one that has been um, taking care of, of that part of the election process. I, I realize that with the, the next election is going to be a bigger election and that's going to be a concern to our at large citizens. We can get back with you on that. Connie, you so Connie is the expert in that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Are you good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Councillor Hargis. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the work on the suggestions to the changes at the election commission policies will you get that to us as soon as you get done with your changes so yes, that we yes. can review it before we have to yes. come and vote on it because we don't want it brought to us that day and then have to vote I, I totally understand yes. and, and I, I agree yes we are Good. finalizing those yes, Councilor Ng yeah thank you I'd begin to wonder if I was on the list or not. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's spoken but I guess yeah. we got two gentlemen here that uh, yeah this may be for Marcus uh, I just recently got an updated list of most current uh, up to like maybe um, March or April, something like that. There is a lot of deceased people yeah. on my list that I know personally, and I know one of them has been on there for nine years now. So who is taking care of these? I mean, it's not my job because if I tell you they're deceased, you'll say, well, you can't do that. You can't tell us that. So whose job is that? Because now here's the deal. I won't mail them anything because I know them, you know. But there's going to be people running that has no earthly idea, and they're going to get these in the mail. And that offends those people to think that the Cherokee Nation doesn't realize that their mother or their father had passed away several years ago. So what, what's the plan to fix that? And I, I know I've brought this up before, you know. Uh, there's, a, there's a form. Uh, that has to be filled out um, go. and that's just one of those policy things uh, if you have anything else to speak um, into that yes Marcus is correct we must have the proper documentation before we can remove them um, from um, the list um, what I would encourage you to do is if you know people that are on there and you have contact with family members if you could just give them our information or say you know hey your mother's on there uh, if you could contact the election commission we would send a form uh, but until we actually have um, something uh, documented we're not allowed to do that uh, the other thing that we do um, we have those forms available at the precincts uh, during election day and that is available as family members come in and if they see, you know, they're signing in or something and they see their mother's name next to theirs or something, they'll say, well, that's my mother, she's deceased. We offer them a form at that time if they would like to fill that out at that time and they can give it to us, then we bring it back and we take care of that. Um, so um, those are kind of the avenues that we use to try to get people off of that list and we are continuously trying to work on that because we understand that you know when you guys send out your literature you know that that's more expense you know for people that that are deceased you know if they're deceased and you sent that to them but until we have the proper documentation so you know the the easiest way which might take a little bit of your time you know if you see somebody on the list and you run into that family member or you call them if they would contact us, we can send them a form. So um, 
we can get it off that way. And I, I don't mind doing that, but I, I, what I worry about is how many how many of these people are voting. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, can that happen? Um, somebody request a ballot in their name and be vote, voting in our elections. Well, I will say one time since I've been on that a um, that situation happened and um, we were aware of that and we uh, retrieved that ballot and uh, locked it in the vault. So we are constantly trying to be aware of that. So um, our procedure and our policies and our system, you know, we're we're very confident that, um, I'm not saying that can't happen, but we try every way for that not to happen, and I know that we have caught that in the past. So, um, okay. so well, you know, whatever you can I'm do to... I'm still seeing these names pop whatever, up. Yes, <coughs> yes, and, at, and we certainly would like to get them off yeah. of the list also. Um, and, you know, I will say, I've um, when I was a precinct official before, um, I had even offered when someone said, well, that's my mother right there and she's deceased, I offered them a form. They were not ready to make that step to actually take their mother off of that role. So sometimes you run into that, I don't know how often it happens, but sometimes people, you know, that's a sensitive issue to them, especially if it's just recent, you know. So, so there's a, a lot of factors there, but um, anything that you all could do to help us in that process, because we want to take care of that also, but until we have the formal documentation, we can't. Um, and then at community meetings, we have those forms available also. When people come to our table, we can take care of that at uh, community meetings also. So we try every avenue that we can to to get that taken care of. Well, I so did I get a letter understand. back from a family one time and told me to remove their name, their mother's name, and all this, but I mean, they were so mad at that point, I yeah. wasn't about to remove her name, right. you know, because yeah. I thought it's not my job, yeah. you know. Right, and just as you said, you know, it's not your job and we can't <coughs> do it until we have something that says, you know, officially to do it, so. Are you good? I'm good, thank you. Councilor Warner, you're the yes, one sir. that haven't spoken. Oh, thank you. Uh, just. Uh, Maybe I was sitting here listening to Councillor Anglin talk about this and just a, maybe an idea, just a friendly idea, uh, like a public service announcement. You know, we, I was sitting in the clinic early this morning and, you know, we've got our TVs, uh, we've got OCO TV, uh, the funeral home and, and Sal saw and a lot of our local funeral homes, they're, they're already briefed in, you know, how to, if somebody needs human services help for a burial policy, we may brief them a little bit on that. That would get your inside the 14 county. It's not going to get everybody. Public service announcement's not going to get everybody, but those funeral home directors, they, they do, their, the ones that are good, they have a way of dealing with people that are grieving. And like Councilor Anglin said, you know, that grief, it's, uh, we're all so busy. It's right. gonna, it, it all comes in little small increments at a time. And, and I understand some people don't want that name removed, uh, but Maybe kind of we're getting into that time. Maybe we, we put something special together. That is, you know, and, and that's gentle, that's warming, that's also thoughtful. That way you don't, because I've seen the ones that are upset. Mm -hmm. I've had several people call me, hey, my, my father just passed away. Mm -hmm. um, how can I get them? But they're, not everybody's a conscientious voter right. that's like that. Yes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But, man, and that's just, that's just one of several ideas. And then also there's also the ideas that I've seen passed around of, you know, if there's so many times that you don't make it to the poll that you're removed, I mean, of course, that would be some legislation for you guys or what, or however. But I think a public service announcement, we've got several avenues to get stuff out there, but something that's mindful that, uh, of, of what people are going through. And it may have been somebody that's nine years past, but, you know, trust me, that, that time, that grief, it, it takes a while. So thank you. Good point. You're not through walking shit? Never through, Speaker. Okay. I'll give you about three more minutes, and so we're going to move. Uh, I, I've had my hand up twice. Go ahead, Counselor. Okay, yeah, okay. Counselor Walking Stick is happy. We got everybody. Go ahead. Go ahead, Austin. Uh, two things. The election commission <coughs> ultimately makes the decision. If you guys invest, yeah, I heard, you guys investigate, but it goes back to the election commission for decision. Is that correct? Is that what I heard? Yeah, it depends on what it is. I mean, if it's a crime, we're going to charge someone with a crime. If it's they're wanting to know whether or not election law was violated and they would take some action against a candidate, yeah. then it would go back to them. So it depends on what the issue is. And 
briefly. I mean, we have things as simple as someone put the Cherokee Nation seal on their election sign. Is that okay? And we give an opinion back as to whether or not they can do that. I mean, you're not talking about it. It's not on standing. It is their law doesn't cover it. They don't know what to do with it. Someone's made a complaint, so they send it to us. But yes, if if it involves a candidate and they may take some action against that candidate, we would give our results back to them. If it's about a voter, somebody who's dead trying to vote, then we would probably contact the marshal service and attempt to file charges against someone who committed criminal fraud. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the second thing I was uh, uh, asking about was this the um, uh, in, in relation to what Councillor Shaw was saying. Uh, does the EC send a I know in district they send all registered voters a, um, a, a current voters registration card in advance of the election. Do you do that with all the at large voters? Yes. So they do get a notification that there's an Correct. upcoming election with a something that should that's official that says that there's an election coming up. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's correct. Are you good? I'm good. Thank okay. you. All right. Uh, thanks, Speaker. The, uh, the early voting that takes place in our elections, if a candidate is wanting to get access to the people that's already voted in early voting, is that list available to the candidates that are running? In that, in that election, if they've already voted at that time? Yes, let's say the, the, the three days early voting is already done and the candidate wants to come to the election commission and get a list of people that's already voted. Is that list available to the candidates? I believe that that is correct. Um, I, I need to totally double check on that, but I, I believe that that is correct. So that, that's Can I get back with you on that candidates? for sure, on the time frame on that? Yeah, yeah, if you would. We can verify. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Speaker. Okay. Good question. All right. Anybody else? Good report. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Swepson, Tax Commission. Don't depose this lady. She's all right. Good <laughs> afternoon. I do believe you have my report, and I'll try to address any questions that you might have. All right, anybody? Councilor Buzzer. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, access for disability zero to We have, they have sent me four options, so now I'm looking to see how we can pay for one of those options. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're working on and, it. And the other thing I mentioned before is actually putting some signs up out there right. for handicap. Yeah, we're working on getting all that together. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, sir. Okay. Uh, Councilor Austin. Speaking of signs for handicap, uh, I was just asked if we have signs for the handicapped that actually say it in Cherokee at all with the uh, standard uh, the, for, our, for around our medical facilities. Uh, and I don't believe I've ever seen a handicapped sign that actually has Cherokee, Cherokee language on it. No, but I can, I can check on them. I mean, we're not the ones that make those or anything, but we can, I can check to see. I would appreciate that. Okay, are you good? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, Sharon, good report. Thank you. Uh, Self-governance. Anybody here from self-governance? Karen's on the traffic. Tell her she's up first next. Okay. <laughs> okay, we've got Jamie Hummingbird. Jamie was here early. He's dependable. Good afternoon, Council. Hi, we have a lot and of things in front of you, so I'll stand on my report, but we'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. One question, Speaker. Happy anniversary. Thank you very much. 22 years. 22 years. I've, I've married up. I don't know how I did it, but I thank God every day. <laughs> okay, anybody? I have one question. Councilor Walker, uh, your, uh, your entire program, is it completely funded by Cherokee Nation, or are some of it funded by CMB? Uh, the way our funding works is we have four different sources of revenue, if you will. Okay. We receive... Uh, individual license fees that we assess on the uh, uh, whether it be a vendor or an actual individual that works at the casinos we receive machine operating fees uh, similar to what you see with a uh, coke vending machine or like, like bgt or for, for, from a vendor correct okay correct uh, we also receive uh, facility licensing fees those are annual uh -huh. and, and the rest of the uh, uh, sources or whatever we don't get from those sources we deduct from our overall budget 
-hmm. and that uh, money or that that amount there is then prorated on a 12-month basis and that is charged to C&E as an operating fee. Okay, so C&E covers the remaining cost that you guys are short from fulfilling your operational budget for the year? Yes. Okay. Second. Now, uh, I guess B BKD done an audit and C&B isn't supposed to be funding you guys anymore because uh, you guys regulate them. Uh, so the tribe is now going to cover that remaining cost or CNE is still covering that remaining cost? Oh, the, the, the way I understand this whole issue playing out is, uh, well, first of all, the, uh, the funding mechanism that we had or even currently still have in place is not against NIGC regulations. Mm -hmm. What I believe that we were talking about when BKD uh, issued their opinion on as far as the funding process goes is moving it from an expense down to a, uh, uh, as they call it, below the line expense. So instead of it being a direct expense of the gaming operation, now it is considered uh, some other type of, I'm, I'm not the accountant, so I'm not sure exactly what the right term is, uh, but it is uh, going from an expense line item to a, a line item that's deducted after uh, the profit and loss has been already determined. So it's kind of like uh, uh, your... It's a, grant. it's a grant given to the Cherokee Nation. Correct. More or less, and then Cherokee Nation is covering the remaining balance. Right. And all the money that we do get goes into a... Uh, fund that's maintained within the Tribal General Fund. So the Cherokee Nation, and of course, this body approves our budget every year. So those funds yeah, come through us. Joe, uh, Damien, do you know what that remaining balance is generally on a year-to-year -year basis? I, I know we're growing and there's mm -hmm. more machines, but what's the average, uh, what's that window? Uh, I'd hazard a guess right now. I, 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 I really couldn't give you a good estimate, but I can go back and give you our uh, funding for the last however many years to give you a good average. I just want to know what that window is. I, I know your licenses and all that stuff kind of make you self-sufficient mm -hmm. and help you, help you run yourself. I want to know what that remaining balance is. I, at this point, I would say it was, if we, we uh, assess an operating fee of about uh, 300000 per month. Uh, there's about 200000 or so that gets paid every month. So we're looking at uh, probably north of two and a half million. So I, I want to say right now we're looking at about 2.8 or so. Okay. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Are you speaker. good? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, Councilor Buzzer. Uh, with this new uh, <coughs> legislation coming to the state on the ball and the dice game. Yes, sir. Are you going to have to increase staff for that, or are you going to absorb that? Uh, I think we can absorb that. We're okay. we're making preparations right now to get everything set in place to. Uh, uh, get balls and dice ready to, <laughs> no pun intended, but to roll out ball and dice. Do you have any idea? You may not know. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, I'm useless without a studio audience. You I'm may sorry. not know how many uh, facilities would have those. Do you have any idea? Right now, no. We are, in fact, we just had a conference call this morning with operations to talk about our preparations, and we are going to be uh, starting uh, weekly meetings starting next week to lay that foundation and hopefully along the way we'll find out exactly what the implementation plan will be. Um, yeah, revenue. revenue, I don't know. Sean. Sean would be the best one to ask. Mm -hmm. Thanks, sir. Yes. Um, gaming compact, when is that up? It, is, it comes up effective 2020. Okay. Uh, it's, it is what I consider to be an evergreen compact. And that means that even if the, the two parties don't come back to negotiate any different terms, it automatically renews for yes, successive 15-year terms. So uh, the quote-unquote deadline may come and go, but the compact would still be in effect. Okay. Unless somebody... Right. And somebody if, doesn't like Indians up there at the Capitol. True. And even <laughs> that if, happens uh, sometimes. And even if, even if they did repeal the, uh, the State Gaming Act that has the model compact a part of it, the way I understand the provisions of our compact is the games that we have in play at the time that that happens, they survive. Okay. So all of the class three electronic machines as well as the card and table games would survive. Okay, good. That's good news. All right. Okay, good report. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Dr. Morton from uh, H. No, he's, uh, he's traveling. Is that right, Secretary? Dr. Morton on travel? Yeah, he is. Okay. All right, old business.
dropping down to old business. Uh, uh, Councilor Hargis, do you read that? It's just coming from the, uh, the handout instead of the one in the book, but this is an act amending Title 21 and Title 22 of the Cherokee Nation Code annotated relating to the safety for Native American women and creating special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction over non Indian defendants, and I move for its approval. Second. Second. Yes, I appreciate that. Uh, this is a long overdue. Uh, these are Eastern Carolina Cherokees have kind of taken the lead on this, and so I appreciate your support on it. So, any discussion? Councilor Baker Shaw? I do. I want legal counsel to look at our criminal code to ensure that the definition of harassment includes texting, social media, and internet stalking. Yes. Talena, did you hear that? I did hear that. Okay. Uh, Frankie, you're, uh, did you guys make a motion to accept what's in the book or the uh, handout? We okay, do good. I didn't hear that. Just want to yeah. make sure. Now, she has a recommendation. Yes. I want legal counsel to look at the criminal code to ensure the definition of harassment includes texting, social media, and internet stalking. Yes. Okay. I'll look into that and um, if needed, add that if counsel wants. Okay. Is that an amendment that she's making no. today? No. She says for the council to look into it. That's what she said. Sure, it's included. If we need to well, incorporate, well, if we need incorporate, we can. We're going to vote on it today, Speaker. We're going to vote on this. Today. Well, why don't we just amend it right now? Well, we don't know if what wording is in there right now. We haven't had a chance for her to look at it. Well, and and already on the outset said VAWA is so limited. Um, the the definition of a dating relationship has to do with certain contacts and so I'm unsure if it would include a casual online relationship so I would have to look into that sure. it's, it's it's very limited so uh, we can come back and, and make the appropriate amendments if it calls for that counselor okay, okay. I guess full council yeah. can do that yeah okay. it's like can you have that before full council uh, next 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 month uh, those those definitions can you have those amendments ready for uh, council next month if they're needed if, if they're needed if yeah if they're needed I, I'm not sure that that includes that you have to establish a, a relationship now if a relationship is established um, and especially if you have a civil protective order against that person then that would fall that definition would fall under a violation of a civil protective order so then VALA would apply but yeah if, if we need to add that uh, let me double check and uh, I can I can add that in if needed okay right, thanks thank speaker okay all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. all opposed Okay, thank you. Yes, Councillor Vasquez. Okay. Anybody want to be a sponsor? Yeah. It's pretty good for our, for our women out there, and they'll probably include children later on. Uh, Councillor uh, Hargis, you want to read the, what's attached to that? Motion and second. <coughs> Discussion? Is this one the one in the book? Yeah, they go hand in hand. Well, there should be a... Maybe that's one there. The one on your desk. Yeah, number two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Well, now, I have a question. Are you... We should have an amended copy of that. One also? No. No. Oh, okay. Okay. The one that's All right. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I'm ready. Since All right. Okay. Because I didn't need a new one on that. You should have a copy of the, the Title 12 Civil Code. Yeah, we had two handouts. You didn't have two handouts? No. Am I the only one? I'm special. <laughs> I've got other stuff. Is it number two? I don't know. How do you get one? You get one. Mm -hmm. For placing land in the trust, you know, about that. Yeah, we want that one. Yeah. It should be an act amending Title 12 of the Cherokee Nation Code annotated. The title should be the same. Is it the same? It's not the same because I made one clarification. the the uh, the way it read the, read the way it reads in your book. It's open to anybody 
uh, within the jurisdiction of the Cherokee Nation. So that would apply to to two people who are non-Indian. Okay. And I closed that a little bit by making it only apply to a someone who is an Indian. So two non-Indians would not be able to use our court system. Uh, okay. and, and that that's just to prevent uh, overflow of uh, filings. Okay. I move for the approval of the corrected version. Second. Okay. Make sure you give us the, the correct version with that amendment there. Okay. okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Speaker? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda for discussion possible action on an amendment that I have concerning those who we call brothers and sisters, uh, our UKB brothers and sisters. This amendment would allow them to get land in trust. And you ask me why? I see some whys. So this is emergency, this is right? This this is a, this is a time this is emergency. Right correct? to simply Okay. And that's the reason. Help, yeah. Okay. To simply help the Cherokee people. That's okay. why I would be doing it. And it would also it would also keep them from being referred to as foreign. Uh, these are okay. Cherokee people. They're not they're not foreign. They're not foreign. Uh, Okay. And uh, I wholeheartedly believe that we need to take many years of words and put into action. And uh, so again, I I would like to make a motion to amend the agenda for discussion and okay. possible possible action. Motion to amend. Second. That's Got a true. second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Aye. 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 Okay. Shelly, did you get a read on that? <coughs> okay. Yes, Council I'd Warner. like to add, I mean, I, um, I see merit in, uh, in what Councillor Crittenden's looking at, and I've heard several things. Um, I voted to not amend the agenda. But, you know, I don't want to leave this out there, and I know everybody feels the same way, but maybe it's uh, something that a, a work group where we can really get Call to order. I don't believe we're debating this. We should be debating this. <coughs> I'm not debating it. The we're issue is I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not looking for any more discussion today. I'm just saying that right there. Yeah, that's something we can look at, okay? That's all I'm saying. Okay. And, and point because right. I've got numerous questions on sure. why where this comes from sure. and what I, I think that's yeah, point before anybody re recognizes what side I'm on sure thank you okay speaker could, could we take a, a vote of hands of who wants to be on that work group and we could start on a certain date <coughs> because I, I think I, we I'm can with, talk I'm about this I like, we can talk I, about like this strategies on we can talk we can about this let's let's business. finish the agenda here we can talk about this later we'll, we'll do it after this after we can the, New business. Uh, Councillor Smith, you want to take that? Yes, I got a resolution confirming the reappointment of Stephen E. Barrick as a commissioner of the Cherokee Nation Gaming Commission. Put this in for a motion. Second. Got a motion and a second. Is he here? Yes. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Barrett, would you please come forward? There he is. He's been with us how long, Mr. Barrett? About three and a half years. Three and a half years. And yes, sir. And has done a, I would say, what little I know of him is outstanding job. So we appreciate what you've done and making that sacrifice. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Baker Shaw. Yes, Mr. Barrett, uh, lovely to have met you earlier. I have a question. How often do you all meet? Once a month. Once a about, month? About 13 times a year, I think that's correct, but uh, I think it's what we've normally met. And every about 28 days, I think, is what our meeting schedule is. And that's why we end up with an extra one about this time of year every year. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Councilor Buzzer. And, and I suppose you've been asked this before, and I'm sure you're a Cherokee Nation citizen. Yes, sir. Do you participate in our Cherokee elections? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Councilor Warner. I'd just like to be added as a sponsor, Shelley. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? 
Uh, Janice? No, I, I was just going to say that was my only question was were you Cherokee and I had discussed that with Junior ahead of this meeting. So, uh, okay. All. all right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay, got one. Well, congratulations. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate working with you again. It's, it's, it's okay. been very enjoyable. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Councillor Warner, you want to take that? Yes, sir. This is a resolution authorizing the execution of a certain contracts that preserve sovereign immunity, and I put that in form of a motion. Second. Got a motion and second. Any discussion? Yeah, Councillor Lay? And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can't vote for this. Uh, I think this body has constitutionally demanded that we waive sovereignty, and and that's, that's just what I want to say. You know, I think it's our job, not somebody not to be able to pass it off to somebody else to be their job. It's our job. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Councilor Walker, Can we get someone from the AG's office to explain this in a little more depth? Are you sure? No. <laughs> Do you want us or not? Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I want to. <laughs> well, I didn't write this, so. Are, are, are you comprehending what she's telling you? Uh, All right, Chrissy, give it your best shot. What would you like? Can you just kind of go into depth about what's the purpose of this? Sure. So we actually, um, this is a resolution allowing the chief to enter into contracts that do not waive sovereign immunity. Um, there's lots of case law out there about what is and isn't a waiver. It says that tribes must explicitly waive sovereign immunity. But then a case goes to court and they say, okay, this contract didn't say that you waive sovereign immunity, but you agreed to indemnify the other party. And by doing so, we find that you have waived sovereign immunity and they can sue you. So what we believe this resolution does is clarifies the types of contract provisions that we would argue in court are not waivers of sovereign immunity. So if we agree to be bound by Oklahoma law, we don't think that waives sovereign immunity. If we agree to go to mediation as a result of an alleged breach of a contract, we don't believe that that is waiving sovereign immunity. So we've spelled out those five areas, choice of law, venue, <coughs> indemnification, dispute resolution, and injunctive and declaratory relief. And what this resolution says is that Chief Baker can sign contracts that contain that language, and it is not waiving sovereign immunity. Now, uh, Chrissy, uh, previously, this body right here has been the ones to waive sovereignty. So with this, this piece of legislation right here, this is, gonna, um, this is going to take us out of the loop, and it's the, the chief's going to be the only one waiving sovereign immunity for no. the tribe? The chief no. is not waiving sovereign immunity. If there is a contract that says... Cherokee Nation waives sovereign immunity. It still comes before this body. Mm -hmm. If there is a contract that specifically allows for monetary damages or um, submits us to the jurisdiction of a court or contains binding arbitration provisions, those would all still come to this body. What we are attempting to do is clarify to the rest of the world that when you enter into a contract with Cherokee Nation, just because we agree to be bound by Oklahoma law doesn't mean you can sue us. We are still asserting sovereign immunity. That's what this is doing. This is saying Chief Baker signs a contract that says Oklahoma law applies. That is not a waiver of sovereign immunity. It's simply a choice of law. And therefore, it doesn't come before tribal council because we're not waiving sovereign immunity. If you try to sue us, we would still assert the defense of sovereign immunity. But there's some contracts like, um, what was the, the one we had at Sequoia High School? Um, OCAS yes, reporting the OCAS, system. Yes, we had to waive sovereign immunity to go in a contract with that. Uh, so in that situation, if this happens down the road, if this passes, Chief can sign a, a document that says that, you know, we're, we're waiving sovereignty on this contract alone with the OCAS? No. No. The chief can the chief cannot waive sovereign immunity with his signature. <clears throat> You'll still come back to this body. Yes. What well, what we are attempting to do again is is say that these are not waivers, and because we enter into contracts that contain these provisions, we are not waiving, and we are just trying to make that clear to everyone internally, externally, this body, the executive, the judicial department, and it is a. It's a clarification of what is and is not a waiver. But any time that any if we can't negotiate out of waiving sovereign immunity, those contracts still have to come before this body for approval. So you'll, con you'll continue to see the ones that we can't 
well, negotiate out of. Uh, previously, this already set up that way, though. Is that is that correct or, or incorrect? What I don't know what your question is. As far as Cherokee Nation being being sovereign, it's already set up that way where we can't be sued from outside entities. It's already set up that way. Unless we waive sovereign immunity. Unless we waive sovereign immunity. Correct. So we we're already preser preserving sovereign immunity. It's already there. Right. Why why this? Because the way things happen now, these these five things that are that are here that that we're asking to allow the chief to enter in these contracts, if any of those currently appear in a contract, we say in an abundance of caution, because some courts have said this may be a waiver, we're not signing this contract without going before tribal council. Our law says that only tribal council can waive sovereign immunity. These are not waivers of sovereign immunity. And so we believe that this is protecting us. It's allowing us to do business more efficiently, but making clear to everyone, hey, state of Oklahoma, you can't find that if X vendor tries to sue us just because we agreed to be by, bound by Oklahoma law, you can't make a judicial finding that we have waived sovereign immunity because we expressly said that we did not. So this is a, it is a clarification in a way that we've been doing business for a long time and skating around things to say that, yes, we don't have to say that it's a waiver and come get an actual waiver and say that we can be sued. Instead, we're going to sign this contract and say you can't sue us. But again, to clarify, this is very clear that nothing here waives sovereign immunity, that any express waivers of sovereign immunity have to still be approved by, by tribal council. So to say that we are allowing Chief to waive sovereign immunity is incorrect. We are actually trying to do the opposite here. Uh, okay, Speaker, I, this, uh, I think this is redundant. I think we already have our sovereign immunity in place. Uh, I, won't, I won't be supporting this. Point Thank well you. Taken. Anybody else? Council Critton. Especially when we had our conference calls and different things, it was brought out. And, you know, my, my point of view was anything. Explain to me again why we're doing this, what, what comes before us now that after this don't have to come before us? I actually don't think very many of them do. I think, as I believe most of you heard when, when we had other departments and they're talking about it, I think what happens is we forego goods and services that we may need because this language is con contained in there and the AG's office tells departments, you can't enter that contract unless you get a waiver and they say well we don't want to come to tribal council because they're scary and they beat up on people okay, now so. I remember this part <laughs> so uh, we're just not going to do this so they, they don't want to come correct so I can give you a very short example But now they have to no they, they can do it without coming to tribal council now what are they yes. scared of I mean y'all were so mean to me today <laughs> yeah but, but what <laughs> no, what people are these don't. people you're talking about if, no, if so it's a department. Scared. I'm going to give you an easy example. So we have um, this often comes up when we are purchasing software. So we want to buy something from someone that goes on a computer so we can do some work. And there's a 72 page long contract that you all see anytime you click on something. And one that is always in software agreements are declaratory relief. So if you illegally copy their product and start handing it out for free to Cherokee citizens, they can go to court and get an order ordering Cherokee Nation to stop um, handing out their, their product without licensing or without their permission. It is in every single software contract because they don't want money. They want to stop you from ripping off their product. What we have said in the past is either that has to come out of the contract or you, Education Department, have to present a resolution to Tribal Council asking for a waiver of sovereign immunity in order for us to enter this contract because our law doesn't say whether or not we are waiving sovereignty by agreeing to declaratory relief. What this says is, okay, we can sign that because we are affirmatively saying that that is not a waiver of sovereign immunity because that's likely action that they could take against us whether or not we waive sovereign immunity. 
So we're saying, this is saying, Chief can sign a contract where the AG's office is purchasing some software equipment. Because it has declaratory relief in there, our law says that is not a waiver of sovereign immunity, that Cherokee Nation Tribal Council has expressly reserved the right to waive sovereign immunity. So if we sign that contract and that company tries to file suit for us for money, now we've said they can try to make us stop doing something, but if they try to sue us for money, we are still going to say, we have never waived sovereign immunity, we are immune from suit, because our law says you can't sue us, only tribal council can waive immunity, and this is not a waiver. So it allows us to efficiently purchase goods and services that, again, you all heard, you all heard from the departments that they, people would just flat out say, we're not buying this because they're not going to change, Microsoft isn't going to change their contract because they're Microsoft and they don't care if we purchase from them or not. The department is leery of appearing before this body and asking for a waiver of sovereign immunity to purchase software. So we just get stuck in this limbo that you have departments and programs doing without things that they need because of the complicated contracting process that we have at Cherokee Nation. Chris, you're good. You're good at what you do, and I appreciate you. I know, but I'm, I appreciate you explaining that to me. And what I, I don't like, like we witnessed this morning, how hard it is for a tribal council member to get documentation. Uh, I've tried it from uh, months ago, probably a year or two ago, tried to get documentation from the health department here. And just, it's, it seems like when we're trying that, there's an easy, there's an easy explanation why we can't get it. And I just don't like the feel of something being taken away from this body. And that, that's why I can't, I just don't, I don't feel right about it. Just uh, uh, not having to come to this body, you know, for most things. But anyway, I appreciate you, and thank you. <coughs> that, that's a point well taken. It's hard to, when you're talking about sovereignty. Hey, speaker. I know, I hear you. Uh, when you're talking about sovereignty, you know, that's a, that, that's, that's a sensitive issue with us. I remember one, we waived sovereignty on a $2,500 contract. And maybe they need to come to this table here and negotiate with us. We would say, why do we have to waive sovereignty for a $2,500 contract? Uh, but if we're missing out on opportunities on the other end, I understand that as well. And somewhere in there, I guess we have to have faith in our system here, in you guys. And what we're saying is this is not waiving sovereignty. Again, this, you know, I would say the number one job of the Attorney General's office is defending the sovereign immunity of the Cherokee Nation. We do this all day, every day, and we would never, in good faith, bring something before this body that we think would allow people to diminish the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation by suing us. What we are saying is this strengthens sovereignty by specifically laying out what is and is not waivers and giving us backup when someone does sue us to say, our tribal council didn't waive sovereign immunity under federal Indian law. You can't sue us because we're a sovereign Indian tribe, and until we waive immunity, you can't sue us. So it doesn't matter that we agreed to X. You still can't sue us. That, that is the purpose of this. Okay. Councilor Shemmer. Well, I've, it's really very short um, resolution. I don't see anything here that uh, doesn't anything but preserve our sovereign immunity. I don't see anything in here that says anything but that's what it's for. So I, I support this. Okay, anybody else over here? Give everybody a chance to make a brief comment. I'm going I'm to cut it off at three regardless. Uh, <laughs> Councilor Buzzer. <coughs> I've, uh, I've listened to both sides, and especially what Councilor Crittenden said while ago. Uh, I guess uh, being an employee here for several years, I understand some of the problems that this presents by not being able to get stuff because we were looking for some software one time and we didn't come before the council because we didn't want to. We just, <laughs> just didn't want to do it. So we, we, we didn't get the uh, software. I was going to vote 
know on this at first until I attended some of the meetings that they put on there, and I think they've convinced me that uh, I trust them enough to save our sovereignty, and I think she's done this in here. I also go back to what other councilmen said about the tribal council giving up that right, and it, and it concerns me that we're doing this, so that I'm going to support it. I'm going to support it. But the other thing that I, that I, and I'll just say it, you know, I don't want to see the chief signing off on something that I regret that he signed off on. I hear you. A good example is just the other day, we gave $100,000 to Oaks Mission, which I'm okay with that. But I didn't know about it until I saw it in the social media, and that really bothered me. And I'm afraid this may bother me again if I say yes to this resolution. I don't know if there's a safeguard against it or not. Okay. But I think, uh, you know, to move the uh, organization along, I'm, I'm going to support this and take my chances. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else over here? Councilor Angler. Yes, and I, I totally agree with the. Uh, Harley also on this. Uh, after the meeting with Dr. Graham, his leadership now that's in place, I really trust that he will keep an eye on this. And uh, if they're going to write hundred thousand dollar checks to one group, they need to write them to everybody. So, uh, but I hope this doesn't. Well, happen. that wouldn't have anything to do with this. I that's know not that. contract I know with that. <laughs> but I hope it just stays with this and this only. So he he just had not bring that up. <laughs> so I just chime in on that. So. All right. Point well taken. Anybody else over here? We good? All right. I'm, I'm going to see the stick if anybody else has anything to say. Okay, Thank now you're up. Thanks, Speaker. I uh, hear everyone's concern about uh, this body possibly being left in the dark on different contracts and uh, lack of faith of, of some, some of you guys in the uh, administration. A solution, I think, to um, being in the middle is to make a, an amendment where not only the principal chief has full authority, but the tribal council has authority as well um, to, um, to exercise to preserve our sovereign immunity. Uh, what, what's it going to hurt if this body is uh, in the same sentence as the principal chief? It, then that way, it, it, it sums it all up where this body isn't in the dark and nothing slips by us, and we're still in the know of everything. That's a motion, all second. Yes, that, that's that's a that's a friendly. Or a friendly. Okay, you got a motion to amend. And, and uh, speaker, let me be clear. <coughs> uh, Councilor under, Warner. Under be it. Uh, exactly. Uh, uh, let me let me clarify. Where it <coughs> says be it resolved by the Cherokee Nation in that paragraph. Under the one, two, three, under the fourth sentence, uh, it says that implicit waivers of sovereign immunity of the Cherokee Nation, comma, uh, the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council and Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation has the authority to enter into contracts on behalf of the nation containing those express provisions without waiving sovereign immunity of the Cherokee Nation. I put that form of a motion. We got a motion in the second. Shall I just Councilor, get that? Councilor Warner. Yeah, I'd like to have Talena come up front. Okay. And Chris, you might as well stay there too. It almost puts us back to square one, doesn't it? <laughs> you already had that authority. Like it already exists. Yeah. In the act, your motion probably that's that's already act covered in in the act itself. Well, no, it's not. If I, if I may, the tribal council is left out of the act. Councilor Walkenstick has included the tribal council back into the act, or, or into the act. Yes, into the act. Into this resolution. So I don't, I don't think that the tribal council ever signs a contract, ever in the history of the Cherokee Nation. All contracts are executed. And, and we we approve. Uh, legislation. Right. And there's. I don't know. Let me look and see how it's written. David, are you just asking them to report it to us? Uh, no. Uh, what I'm what I'm asking you is is uh, where it says the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council and Principal Chief has the authority to enter into contracts. It didn't say nothing about signing off. The chief signs. The chief or the directors are, are the signature authority, anyways. The council just approves. 
So this has nothing to do with it. On the day-to-day -day operations, we want to start signing contracts. Is Speaker, it's, it's Councilor almost, Austin, go ahead. Okay. If I'm understanding what Councilor Rockingstick is asking, he's changing the language to say TCs can enter into a contract, and then he's saying, but we're not asking to be entered in as a signatory. I don't see how that's how that works. I don't understand the process that he's that he is uh, proposing. It's, Counselor, if, if I may, if I can address him, uh, it's it's the recognizing the authority. It's the it's authority going into a contract. It's not a signature. Uh, it'd be some somewhat it's similar to when we go into a contract with the OCAS company in a contract. This body approves it and. Ron Etheridge or someone signs off on, on the, or the, whoever, whoever signs off on that, we're just approving the authority to go into that contract and waive the sovereign immunity. But I think, I, again, this body right here gets left in the dark on a lot of different things. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Finish. Okay. So anyways, that's, that's all. I think speak. Okay, we're still in discussion. Yeah, Councilor. Well, I, I think you also have to look at the, uh, the last paragraph. Um, talks with a list of contracts ex executed by the principal chief. That is what this is talking about, is, is executing a contract. Yes. Well, that is, and, that's, yeah, yeah. and I don't, I'm not so sure that we're in that process of executing a contract. I don't mm -hmm. think that's this council's job to execute a contract. <laughs> I think we can approve others to execute right. that contract, but we don't execute contracts, and this is what this whole thing is about. That's correct. I would briefly point to the paragraph above where Councilor Walking Stick is talking about it specifically says, any contracts waiving sovereign immunity and also monetary damages or binding arbitration must be presented to Tribal Council for a limited waiver of sovereign immunity by separate resolution or pursuant to a legislative act. So again, that's what we're talking about. Any time that, that someone is asking for a waiver of sovereign immunity, by law, it still has to come before this body. Why is this such a, a I feel like there's resistance. It, this shouldn't be a very big deal. I, I don't it, know it, how you I can. I just don't know if it's necessary. No, I mean, I yeah. understand, I, I see resistance from two angles. So I, I don't accept the friendly. Okay. He, he made a motion and I said. He's got a motion and we've got a second uh, on this language here. Okay, let's vote on that first for the amendment there. All in favor? Oh, what are we voting on? Uh, we're voting on that amendment. For the, for the friendly. Okay, yeah. I thought the sponsors had to accept the amendments. Okay. So will this be just uh, it, it's, sponsors? It's, it, it's not a friendly. It, it, it's a oh. motion. <laughs> he made a motion. Yep. He's right. Okay. Yep. All right. I he, didn't accept, he didn't accept the friendly. Okay. Okay, so we're good? Can I ask? Sure. But you better look that way if you want legal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now this says the list of contracts executed by principal chief will get a we'll Except get a report. We already have this. Right? Yes. We already have it. We they come to us. We don't do the day to day contracts. The chief does. Yes, the treasurer will you're report saying monthly. We want to have any If the chief signs we'll contracts chief, that contain any of these five things up here that are specifically that. listed. You can't have authority then have the no. vote. No, because not all of them will be. We, we have it. We have it. We have not that per this. For sovereignty. They have to come okay. back. We signed to us. hundreds, maybe thousands of contracts. But, a month. but the ones that we would have been left out of the principal chief will because I'm not going to give up the ones that we would have been left out of now the chief has the power so that's that'll be reported okay to it which, which ones it's not a dream thing, happens that way right okay. yes okay so and we would have the ability if you know pardon skepticism uh, but we would have the ability one day to look at those reports and say whoa now and come back and look at this right yes. the law come back and look at the law too. Right. right come back to this you can't undo a contract Right, right, service. right. But if you know, if it's we're gonna uh, say we didn't waive sovereignty. Right. We get these reports <laughs> every month. Yes. We look at it. Yes. And let's say okay. it would get out of hand. I'm not saying it would, but if it would, we could come back and revisit this, right? Yes, I'm trying absolutely. to. I'm trying yes. to get to where I can vote for yes. this. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. That was my point. That was my point. So we can come back if we should need to. 
thing. If it's if it's not going in the right direction a few months down the road and we see somebody out there attempting to take our responsibility as a council, we can say bring that back. Okay. What you're also going to see are the types of contracts that we're entering. Yes, you're going to that's see a good sign. The services that we have foregone because of the complicated contracting process that we have. Um, we've got a couple right now that we're just we're just waiting to see whether or not this thing passes to see whether or not we have to try to spend five months to m remove one sentence out of a contract to purchase Pass a background check system. Passes through where? This. Passes through council. Well, okay. and I might still, add. Uh, you still want to do the motion to amend? You want to go ahead and vote on it or you want to withdraw? Yeah, I mean. Again, well, if you want to, we'll, we'll vote on it. The speaker. Here's here's my thing. Is, I, hey, I understand your argument. Let's just vote on it. We either do yay or nay. Well, as we've already we've already circled this. I understand, but we're giving one person. The He's the chief. I understand. The <laughs> president of the United States. We give yeah. him the the authority whether he cuts Indian programs or not. And we're the elected officials that approve his budget. Yes. And but we're talking about a budget. Well. Yes, it, this it's affects budget because you enter into a contract. Mm -hmm. It does affect the budget. Well, and I think that this body <laughs> needs to be aware of where those dollars are going and what it's going for. Yeah, uh, and, like, and like like the OCAS system at Sequoia High School, we would have never known about it if if we would have been if if this this wasn't here. We would have never known about the OCAS system at Sequoia High School. But we, got, we have handouts. We have we have departments. We can go. I'm visit. just saying, if this body votes this in, you guys are going to be in the dark on a lot of things, and you guys won't. But that's their prerogative. That's their prerogative I to vote they how they want. I understand, but respond to that? well, yeah, well, you can't. You made your point. Now let us vote whether we support it or not. That's a democracy that we have here. That, that's true. I'm okay. just saying that, that that's what you're voting on. Well, yeah, that's what we're voting on. Okay. okay. All right, Council Warner, are we clear on that? <laughs> we are voting on this. His act. amendment. Now, his amendment. Yes, we're going to vote on his amendment first. If that okay. goes forward, then we'll stay with that. If not, then we'll come back to yours. Yes, okay, all in favor for the amendment made by Councilor Walkenstick. Second by Councilor Lay. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. aye. Okay, the ayes have it. Hey, roll okay. call. Roll call speaker. All right, Shelly, roll call vote. Yes for the amendment, no for the amendment. Frankie Hargis? No. Wanda Hatfield? Rex Jordan? No. Dick Lay? And, and ex excuse me now, we're, we're voting on this amendment to pass this act. No, this, no, this, this is the amendment roll. itself. Okay. Okay. Uh, the answer is yes. Okay. Mike Shambaugh? No. Mary Bakershaw? No. Mary Bakershaw? No. Okay. Theo Smith? No. Denise Taylor? No. Victoria Vesquez? No. David Walkenstick? Yes. Brian Warner? No. Bill Anglin? No. Keith Austin? No. Harley Buzzard? No. No. Sean Crittenden? Yes. Mike Dobbins? No. We have three yes. Okay. And 13 no. Right, thanks, Shelly. Okay, now back to the original resolution authorizing the execution of certain contracts that preserve sovereign immunity. Did we have a second on that, Shelly? Okay, have a motion and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. One, two, three. Okay, that concludes new business. Comments? Um, we'll wait on all right, need a motion to adjourn. Motion, all in favor, say aye.